Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for letting me be a guest lecturer in your class again. Um, Professor Bird has been uh, uh, a good friend and supporter. We've shared a lot of uh, reflections and observations about what's going on in this country around health care and the politics of it in the last couple of years. It's a really interesting time. So what I wanted to do is kind of give you an overview of uh, what the issues are now and where they have their roots um, in terms of history. Uh, and so that's what I want to do. And, and I want to give you a background about where I think we're going and how the new federal law, the ACA or Obamacare, uh, comes on the scene to try to um, put it in context for you. I think one of the greatest problems in the conversation about health care reform in our country right now is the lack of context. Um, everyone talks, the media or the politicians talk about uh, health care reform is, and Obamacare like it's in a vacuum, that this is the only thing that we have to debate. In, in fact, it is, um, in my view, uh, regardless of what you think of it, it is a, a logical discussion given all the things we've done since the 1950s in this country. Now, whether we like this policy or not, whether we like the policy framework we've built, Anybody can argue that, but the fact that we're debating these things right now about covering the uninsured is a very natural extension of what we've done over time. So let me show, show you some of that. Uh, first of all, we've got a problem as a country when it comes to solving heavy issues like health care because we are very divided. We are divided along political lines. Uh, in my personal estimation, we have um, made winning politics, winning elections, more important than governing. Now, I don't know how many of you ever um, heard of or saw the ACC play basketball a couple of decades ago when they used to play a slowdown tactic called Four Corners. You, you probably didn't watch that, but I've heard of it. Um, in Four Corners basketball, um, once you cross the midline, you just put a person at each corner of the court and you pass the ball around and you never put it in play. You never tried to take a shot. And um, the goal was just to um, burn the time as much as you could, make more baskets than the other team, and that was it. This was before the shot clock. We now have a shot clock because of this strategy. Well, people who went to see basketball games didn't get to see any basketball. They just saw a team holding the ball and passing it around a little bit. And the same is kind of true in Washington now. Pl uh, winning the game has become more important than playing the game and in the sense that in the four corners basketball, they would win games 10 to 9, 8 to 6. It wasn't about playing basketball. It was just about winning. And now you see a govern government that can't govern itself, can't govern the country very effectively because it's all focused on winning the next election. To me, that's, that's a problem. Uh, we're perpetually in a, an election cycle. The day after all these congressmen get elected, they are running for the next time two years later. And our, our government system is based on, it's built around compromise. If you look at the Federalist Papers, one that I've um, read and known and talked about a lot of times, Federalist Paper, paper Number 10, uh, written by the Founding Fathers, they anticipate the fact there are very different viewpoints in this country. They refer to them as factions. This faction wants this, this faction wants that, another one wants this. Our government is set up in a way that no small group can control the country. And we're watching the Tea Party try to control it backwards with a shutdown. But in general, the government is set up so you have to get some people together and compromise to get things moving forward. Well, that's not how we are playing. We've got a lot of people in the country who don't want to play that way. And so that's really the political backdrop of health care reform in this country, the fact that we have people who are um, using the discussion about health care reform more for election or um, for their own party's success than about the governing uh, of health care itself. So, now, I should tell you also, I, I view myself as an independent politically, so I'm not trying to criticize one party or the other. I'm trying to observe and stimulate you to think so you can reject anything uh, that I say politically that you don't like. But we got a problem. Now, where does that take us? There's a lot of talk about repealing this law. It is a very long shot to repeal this law. Now, why is that? Because 
Um, to repeal a law, Congress has to pass a law that would repeal it, and the President has to sign that. Now, why would President Obama sign a law to repeal the thing that's been his signature? He's not going to do that. Um, no chief executive would do that. Uh, so repeal is a pretty long shot. Now, if, if both houses of Congress were controlled by the, the Republicans, maybe, because you've got a lot of leverage now. The President can't get anything out of uh, uh, Congress. But with a divided government, it's just not likely to happen. So we've got other things coming our way. The debate's not over, um, even though the Supreme Court spoke and we had a presidential election that reaffirmed that the majority of Americans are, are, would prefer President Obama. So if it's not over, where does it go now? Well, the Supreme Court ruled about a year ago that the individual mandate is, is uh, constitutional and can stay in place. But they also ruled that states had an option of whether they wanted to expand their Medicaid programs. Um, I won't go into why they ruled that, but that was the effect, the net effect of their ruling. If you want to know more about that, you can ask a question. I'll, we'll talk about it. But the bottom line is they, they said states have to have an option here. So the big question now, the debate has moved in many ways to the state level instead of just this, the federal congressional level. Now here's some interesting history. In 1966, when we, when we adopted Medicare and Medicaid in the first place, not all the states participated because this is a voluntary program. States don't have to have a Medicaid program at all. The federal government just says, if you want to have one, here are the foul lines within which you have to construct your program, and we'll, if you do, we'll give you money to help you fund it. That's a little bit different than Medicare, which is run, it's a federal program run by the federal government, and it's the same in all the states. Medicaid is not. Medicaid is a joint state and federal program and is different in every state within those very broad federal foul lines. So in 1966, the law was passed actually in 65, and it went live in January of 66. Only six states signed up. By the end of the year, about 26 states had signed up. So half the states liked it, half the states didn't. Well, that sounds really familiar. It's about where we are now. So 11 states came on the next year. You see there 13 more states, primarily the southern states, came on over the next four or five years. Uh, the bottom line is it was a trickle um, kind of approach. They didn't all just jump on it immediately. And you see Arizona actually waited until um, uh, 1982, which is a long time to hold out. You know, they're acting as though if they hold out in a group, maybe they've got some leverage. But Arizona didn't have any leverage as a single holdout. So um, ideological opposition in some of these states is, looks the same now as it did in 1966. Interesting to note. Um, now, why are they reluctant? This is interesting. Why are the states reluctant? Well, there are a lot of reasons they're reluctant. Um, one right up front is that the, a lot of these red states oppose President Obama, and therefore they oppose Obamacare, and therefore they oppose anything associated with Obamacare, which is Medicaid expansion. That is a state like South Carolina. Governor Haley opposes President Obama and uh, Obamacare, and one of the things that frustrates us as a hospital community is when we stand up and we argue that it makes sense for our state to expand the Medicaid program, there are a lot of people who just say, oh, you're for Medicaid expansion. Well, you must be for Obamacare, and you must be for Obama, so you're the enemy. Well, we're looking at the issue based on whether it's smart to expand Medicaid or not and whether the health care system needs to be reformed. But we're so, we're so much in this political environment where you have to pick a side that whatever opinion you have is automatically ca categorized one side or the other, and it's tough. So a lot of there's a lot of opposition to President Obama. Secondly, states' rights. Now, states' rights, if you um, remember your history or if you all have discussed it in class, that is the idea that the federal government can't make the state do things that the federal government hasn't been given the authority to do. We, we as the states created the federal government and gave it certain powers. It only has those powers. Um, and a lot of states say, you can't make us do this. Now, the fact of the matter is uh, the federal government can effectively get the states to do things by promising money or withholding money, even if they don't have the right to make 
the decision. For example, speed limits. Speed limits are purely state um, decisions. Federal government cannot set a speed limit in the state. So why is it the same in all the states at 70? It's because the federal government says if you want our um, federal highway funds, you won't go higher than 70. And so states like South Carolina say, well, just so you know we have the right to set it wherever we feel like it, we think 70 is a good number for us, and <laughs> we'll take the money so we bring it on. And, um, the same is true with Medicaid. Some people are arguing that the federal government doesn't have this right, but the fact of the matter is it does have the right to say, if you want the money, here's how you have to use it. Um, administrative burden. There is a cost and a burden associated to bringing on new people and managing all those new people. Simple as that. 10% is still a big commitment. When you say uh, the federal government will pay 90% of the cost of covering these uninsured people under Medicaid, the state only has to pay 10% of the costs. Now, in the first three years, it's zero for the state, but eventually it's 10%. Well, that sounds great, but there, there's still 10% to be paid, and that's a big number. So if I said to you, by analogy, um, I will give you a $5 million house on Lake Murray right now, today, as long as you can pay me 10% of it in cash. If you give me $500,000, I'll give you a, $10 million, a $5 million home for free. You don't have to do anything else. How many of you are going to bring me cash today in the amount of $500,000 for your $10, $5 million home? I mean, it's a great deal. You just can't take advantage of it. And that's what our, some of our Republicans in, in the states that are having budget difficulties are saying to us. I, I grant you it's a great return on investment. I just can't make the investment. And some people are opposed purely on the political ideology. Some are opposed because they don't feel like we can afford it budgetarily, even though they are not so adamantly opposed to the ideology kind of thing. Uh, there are some who are fearful that the federal government's not going to keep his word, that seven or eight years out, they won't still be putting 90% of the money in. Well, that's, that's a problem. If they, my response to that would be if they don't do this, then we have to, all the states have to restructure the Medicaid program. But that is a fear. And then the last one, the woodwork effect, is uh, when, when you tell all these people they have coverage, there are people currently covered or eligible who have not signed up. They may start to come out and sign up, and that will cost the state more money. So there are a lot of different reasons that states um, don't want to expand Medicaid. Uh, but this chart, more than any other one I've ever seen, explains why, to me, it says this is a political objection, not a financial objection. And let me tell you what it means. The Kaiser Family Foundation, which is nonpartisan, uh, they study the uninsured. They do a lot of work that's viewed from both sides as very objective. They ask, well, if every state expanded their Medicaid programs, which one would benefit the most and which ones would benefit the least? And the, the ones on the left would benefit the most. Kentucky is number one. South Carolina is number four. And then the ones that would benefit the least you see on the right, and Massachusetts is at the bottom. What they already did their expansion, we modeled this Obamacare on Romney Care in Massachusetts, so it stands to reason they don't have much to go. They don't have many people uninsured anymore, so they don't, they're not going to get a big benefit out of it. But here's the interesting thing. Look at the left-hand side. Nine out of the ten states that would benefit are red states politically. Republican, okay? On the right, uh, eight out of the ten are blue states. So this is what's going on politically that's really hard to explain other than just pure ideology. The blue states are arguing vehemently for a policy that would send their money over to the red states, and the red states don't want anything to do with that. That is not the way federal policy usually works. A lot of the federal policy, tax policy, is redistributional. The richer states put in money and it gets spread to the poorer states. So the Republican states generally, the red states, particularly southern states, get a lot of money from the wealthy states like New York, California, Texas, and others. So it's very interesting now that the, the red states don't want any of this money from the blue states. You don't hear about that with education. You don't hear about it with highway funds. You, 
It's just this. So that says to me that the ideological divide here is so great that we don't even want their money. Don't send me your money. That's just, just kind of crazy. That's not the way it's normally been done. So this all begs the question, has it ever been this political around health care? And the answer is yes, it has. It has been inherently political since World War II. And that's because we collect a lot of tax money and we spend it on health care. And whenever you're collecting a lot of tax money and spending it, people have strong opinions about whether that is spent the right way. So it is political. Now, it may not have been quite as divisive, you know, right down the straight party line votes. Uh, for example, when the way the Congress used to work, they fought hard over Medicare um, and Medicaid. A lot, the people who didn't want it put up their best fight. But once it was time to vote and they knew they'd lost the vote, many of them went ahead and voted to do it. They didn't do that around Obamacare. Once in the 1960s when they did that, they couldn't really criticize the other party anymore because they had voted for it as well. But this time, everybody held out on party lines. So uh, we have been inherently political. So let, let's go back and see how did we get this modern health care system. We didn't have the modern health care system that we have now before the Second World War. This thing came into being around the Second World War, and it's because in the 1940s we adopted an employer-sponsored health care model. Uh, we sent 5 million men overseas. Let me back up a second, just so you know that I'm not making this up. Prior to the Second World War, we had come out of a depression, global depression, but particularly in the U.S. We didn't have a lot of money to spend, and we didn't have a lot of things we could spend it on in health care because we didn't discover penicillin until 1929 or so. So in the 1930s, we didn't have a lot of money to spend, and there wasn't a lot to buy. Surgical or pharmacological advances were just really nothing. Medical care at that time looked like what nursing care, what we think of as nursing care. Somebody's sick, you put them in a bed, you tend to them, try to keep them comfortable, hope they get better. Even in the 1950s, we didn't know how to treat a heart attack. So in the 1950s, if you had a heart attack, we put you in the bed and hope you get better. And you can imagine what the statistics were on survival. I mean, it's, we're not helping at all. You just pull through or you don't. So we get up to the 1940s, we really hadn't been spending much on health care and there wasn't a lot to spend on. But we began to have some advances. So in the 1940s, we sent 5 million men overseas, but we had to ramp up production in our factories. We had to build a lot of things. They go the men on the troop ships. We had to build things in our factories like uh, planes, tanks, guns, all those kind of things, things you need for a war effort. And so uh, we, our employers, had a lot of jobs in these factories, but the workforce was overseas. So how do you get workers when you um, have job vacancies? If you had a business and you had a job that was vacant and you were offering this much money and nobody wanted that job, would you offer more money or less money? More. more. So we started seeing upward pressure on wages. And the federal government got really worried because they said, this is not good in the middle of wartime to have inflation. So we put wage controls in effect. Now, my dad was a Second World War, is a Second World War veteran. I knew we had price controls on things like gasoline, silk, rubber, the things you need for a, I didn't realize until a couple of years ago we had wage controls. Now, people talk about how heavy-handed the federal government is right now, but just imagine if this government said, nobody gets a raise until we say so. <laughs> That's pretty heavy-handed. That's the middle of wartime. Now, there was patriotism in it as well because our soldiers weren't getting raises, and so the people said, well, if they're not getting a raise, I mean, I, I'll hold my salary raise. Bottom line is, though, employers still had to compete for their workers, and they came up with some creative ideas, and one of them was, let's offer health insurance. Doesn't cost much because there's not much to cover, but it's an attraction, so let's do that. So we began offering health care insurance. At the end of the war, we just kept on offering it. We converted our factories from making tanks and planes to cars and washing machines, and our economy just kept right on going. Now, 20 years later, in the 1960s, we realized there are some people 
who will never get insurance under an employer-based model because they don't do what? They don't work. They don't work. Women. So if you're not working, you're not, no employer is covering you, so you're not going to be insured. So we adopted two programs, Medicare and Medicaid, to address these gaps. Medicare, as you know, covers people from the 65 to the end of their life. Now, what was the average life expectancy for a man in 1965. Anybody know? 67 and a half. 30 months. So we're going to cover you for 30 months. That's the deal. Mike, 30 months. You got 30 months. You know, that's all I'm doing. It's, it's, it seems silly how short that was. Now life expectancy is so much longer. It costs a lot more. We didn't, you're going to see a trend here, I think. We are notoriously short sighted in our policy making because. We solved the problem that's immediately before us, but we really don't think ahead very far. And you can see that with our budget and, and shutdown and, and uh, debt ceiling kind of debates right now. But we adopted Medicare, then we adopted Medicaid to cover primarily women and children. Now, why not men? I always figured that it was because Congress was chauvinistic in the 60s and figured men needed to go out and support themselves while the women took care of their families. But that's actually not true. I realized a couple of years ago as I did some research, in the 1960s we still had a draft and every able-bodied man served and got VA benefits for the rest of their life. So we didn't have a problem with uninsured men in the 1960s unless they were disabled and we covered them one of these policies. We had a problem with women and children being uninsured, so we built a program to cover women and children. And now Fast forward, we got rid of the draft. There are a lot of men who don't have children who don't have insurance either. So that's how we put the Medicare and Medicaid programs together in the 60s. We fast forward another 20 years up to the 1980s, and we realize there's still people who don't have any coverage. Um, and so we, we said, we're going to let them go to the emergency rooms. That's where they will get their access to care. Now. Um, I have President Reagan's face up here because he signed this law um, into existence. And you all know that President Reagan is kind of the father of the modern conservative movement in this country. Uh, why would he s sign this law in effect? This, this law, in my view, is what makes so many Americans think there's a right to health care. You can go to the emergency room even if you can't pay and they'll take care of you. Why, why did Reagan sign this? Well. We saw some really ugly things happening in this country. Um, I represent the hospital industry and it's not, um, I take no pride in explaining. There were hospitals that would turn people away who couldn't pay. And they would turn very sick people away who couldn't pay. And there were a couple of bad examples in New York and Los Angeles where people were turned away, walked outside and died on the sidewalk. And 2020 20 and 60 Minutes, at that time we didn't have cable news all over the place, but those news programs picked it up, and you can imagine how that made people feel. This is not the country I want to live in, where you die on the street and watch people die on the street. So Congress took an act and uh, took an action and, and adopted this law. Uh, the lesson to be taken from that, I think, is no matter how ideologically strong you are, if you're the president and the people say they want you to do something, most presidents are going to do it. And uh, it is the you know, you can argue this is morally high ground to say we're going to take care of the poor, uninsured people when they're really ill. So it wasn't a hard thing for President Reagan to do. I don't think President Reagan was nearly as extreme um, as our modern Tea Party would like to argue. A lot of the things that he did were compromised with Democrats and so forth. And he was a a very effective politician, but wasn't necessarily as strident uh, as we see today. But anyway, so the 1980s, that's kind of how we rounded out our health care framework. So we had, from the 1940s, employer-sponsored insurance, and that's about 60% of all Americans. Then you've got uh, government insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, also TRICARE. That's about 25% of the population. And uh, even for a lawyer like me, I can do the math. That's 60 plus 25, 85% of the people are covered. What about the rest of them? They're uninsured. That's 15% of the population. So they are the target of this MTAL legislation. 
Now, I told you that the Affordable Care Act is a logical extension of all the policy decisions we've made because we've left 15% of the people in this country uninsured. It is a natural, it's natural to expect that we're going to debate how to cover them. And hospitals are going to say, as that number grows, you, we're taking care of poor people who can't pay at our cost. We get nothing for that. And we have to charge somebody, so we charge the insured people. And they don't like us doing that anymore. So if I can't shift the cost over there, i got to have some strategy for these people who are coming in here. They need to have some kind of form of insurance. So you can see why this is a very natural conversation to have. It is politically very charged, but the conversation itself is the natural extension of, of what we've been doing. Uh, we did a couple of other things in 2006, another 20-year jump. We did expand Medicare by making uh, coverage for prescription drugs, Medicare Part D. Now, this is interesting to me because this was President Bush, Republican, expanded Medicare. Uh, some of the big objections to Obamacare are uh, is too much government control of health care and it costs too much, a trillion dollars over a decade. Well, Medicare Part D costs three quarters of a trillion dollars over a decade. That's a lot of money. Just four years prior, and um, Medicare is exclusively a government program. There's no, there's no commercial insurance in it. So to say, for the Republicans to say, we don't like the idea of expanding government coverage and it costs too much, that's pretty hypocritical four years after you just expanded Medicare Part D at a cost of three quarters of a trillion dollars over a decade. Um, now there are some reasons why the two positions are different. Uh, number one, 06 was before the big financial um, or economic meltdown. So the country was much more sensitive in 2009 and 10 to what we could afford and national debt and all that. That's clearly the case. But there's another reason too, uh, and that has to do with who is benefiting from the laws. Who benefits from Medicare Part D? What's that? Older people? 65 and older? Mm -hmm. What big organization do many of them join? AARP. That is a powerful political force. They are active in political campaigns. Medicaid population, not so much. So it's really interesting that you had a lot of people who liked, very active political people, who, are, who liked Medicare Part D expansion and didn't like or were made to fear the Obamacare proposal. But if you look at it through just objective lenses, both of them expanded government programs, both of them cost a lot of money. So how do you say you would never have it? You'd never do that if you're a Republican. Well, you just did it. So that's part of our, our history. Then we get up to 2010, we had health care reform, and you know you can see both sides of the debate here in these photographs. But you, you all watched that happen. Um, I told you what the U.S. healthcare system was built to do. It was built to recruit workers in World War II, provide coverage for people 65 at the end of life, cover the uninsured, and treat everybody in emergency conditions even if they can't pay. But what was it not built to do? This is interesting. It was never built to promote good health, or manage chronic disease, or contain costs, or encourage physicians and hospitals to collaborate. But that's what we complain about, that it doesn't do. So um, I don't know if you've ever heard this quote under the warning sign. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. This is um, uh, an engineering concept or out of systems engineering. If you don't like the system, what the system is producing, you've got to go back and look at your process. Albert Einstein said it a different way. The definition of insanity is doing things the same way and expecting a different result. So a lot of politicians, including Governor Haley, say our system is broken. I would argue, I'm not going to argue it doesn't need to be changed, but I would argue it's not broken. It's doing just what we built it to do. It was built to fix acute illness at any cost. Whatever it costs, we're going to take care of it. It was not built to manage costs or manage chronic disease or promote good health. There's nothing in our healthcare system that's, that people get paid to do that. So 
let's not be surprised that it is doing what it built to do, what it was built to do. Let's have a conversation about what we would prefer that it do, and then how we rebuild it to make it do those things. That's that's I think where you can have a fair conversation. Now, groups ask me all the time, why is this healthcare reform stuff so hard? And I tell them, uh, after a lot of reflection on my end, I think it's because Americans want three things that are very hard to reconcile from the healthcare system. Uh, number one, they want the best care in the world. If you, if you think I'm wrong, you'll tell me. But I think that we don't want to think it's better in Mexico or Canada. Number two, we want um, somebody else to pay for it. <laughs> and number three, we do not want to be told to change our behaviors. I have rights. You cannot tell me I can't smoke or that I have to eat certain stuff or I can't have fast food or I can't have a big gulp. We're all into us, you know. And so we have built a health care system. If you built a health care system that had the highest quality facilities and the patient didn't have to pay and nobody had to be accountable for their own health behaviors, it would look like what we have. <laughs> my, in my view. That's what we built. We're going to shield you from the cost of behaving however you want. We're going to leave you alone. That, it doesn't work. It's, it's crumbling under its own weight. So, uh, a couple of lessons here. Number one, personal freedom has a price tag. And it's, I'm not saying we shouldn't have freedoms, but there are prices that to be paid. Smoking, single most preventable cause of death, disease, and disability in this country. It kills so many people um, prematurely. You see almost a half a million. Uh, another 8.6 million live with serious illnesses and $96 billion a year in medical costs from smoking. Obesity is worse, $147 billion in annual medical costs. You can prevent these things. You don't have to smoke and you don't have to be uh, obese. And I'm not saying that everybody can manage their weight. There are some people who can't, but I mean, I struggle with it. I I'd rather eat than work out. It's just the reality. But I ought to bear some cost associated with my behaviors, but right now I get to send you all the bill for it. If I want to smoke and weigh 500 pounds, it's not costing me any more than it costs anybody else. You all just pick out more. We have to have conversations about that. So let me show you um, some statistics here. From 1985 to 2010, the change in obesity in our country. Um, this is CDC data, and it's measuring obesity by people's um, body mass index. If your BMI is 30 or greater on this chart, you're considered obese. And mine is right at 29 or 30, so I'm on that cusp. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody else. I'm in here with it. The question is, what percentage of the of people in these states have a BMI less than 10% or greater than 10%? Uh, the white states, we didn't have any data for them. Light blue is less than 10. Darker blue is more than 10. So we're going to go through these um, these years, 85 to 2010, okay? This is 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91. We got to add a new color <laughs> because now we got states where there's more than 15% of the population. 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97. We got to add a new color. 98, 99, 2000, 2001. We got to add a new color. Now we have states with greater than 25% of the population obese. 2002, 3, 4, 5, add a new color. 6, 7, 8, 9, and in 10, the last blue state is gone. Now here's the, here's the question. Um, do we really expect that health care is not going to cost more? I mean, you, you all aren't physicians, or some of you may be physicians or clinically trained or nurses, but even the even non-clinical people understand that obesity brings with it back pain, high blood pressure, um, diabetes, hip and knee replacements, all kind of things that go with it. That it costs a lot of money. So that is that driving our health care costs upward. Um, at the same time, we are among 17 of the uh, major trading partner nations, Europe, uh, Canada, U.S., um, Australia, Japan, we're the least healthy of all of them. 
in a lot of different measures. We rank dead last. And then in South Carolina, we're 46th out of 50 in the least healthy country in the world, among the developed world. That is not a good place to be. And these are the things that are driving our low um, health status, our poor health status. A lot of them are related to obesity, a lot of them to tobacco use. Some of them have nothing to do with any kind of health indicator. Poverty, um, crime, graduation rates, uh, premature deaths, other things. But this is, this is a wake-up call for our state. We've got to address this. We want to be a healthy state. We want to be economically strong, and we've got to work on that. So the, the doctor would ask, why is all this my fault that the health care costs are going up? For crying out loud, I mean, you're, you're not as healthy as you used to be. So I'm having to do more. Um, the second problem is, now, we said personal freedom has a price tag. The second problem is somebody's got to pay the price tag. And there really are two different groups that pay. Now, one is business and one is government. We talked about that. Most Americans are covered by employers. Another 25% of them are covered by government. So employers and government are paying the bills. Now, some people have said, yeah, 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 but really it's individuals. Well, I agree with that. I mean, they're individuals make up employers and government. But the fact of the matter is the bills are paid by the government or by employers, and they don't like what's happening to their health care costs. Um, See, that didn't, it didn't like that slide. There we go. Uh, this shows you just the growth in expenditures in our nation. You've seen this probably before. This is the, the unsustainable cost curve. But it's undeniable. It just keeps going up. We spend more every year. And, and if you add on obesity and you add on um, the baby boomers, it's not going to go down. It's just going to keep going up. So a lot of fear about how we're going to manage that as a country. And that brings us to um, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, a lot of people are really um, upset about this law, and I try to tell people, look, you've got to recognize this law is not the source of change in the healthcare world. It is the product of a changing marketplace. You remember Bill Clinton? He told George Bush, it's the economy, stupid. I don't know if you all recall that. Uh, George Bush Sr., had come back from the Gulf War, and he was a war hero, and had kicked Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. He was riding high politically. It looked like he was unbeatable for the election. Bill Clinton ran against him and said, I, I know he did great things there, but that's not what this election is about. This election is about the economy. And he said, it's the economy, stupid. The same argument could be made. It's, for people who don't like this law, um, it's the market. The market cannot bear the status quo to continue. And so we have to have change. And I would argue a lot of the things in the Affordable Care Act will happen even if you get rid of the law. Things like, um, well, let me show you a couple of things. I don't know if it's on there. I'll just tell you what the law does. The law seeks to do six things, six big things. Cover more people. It does that. Um, by trying to encourage more commercial private insurance and by using more government insurance. Remember, now, we have a hybrid system. A lot of people covered by their employers with private insurance. A lot of people covered by the government, Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE. That leaves a gap in the middle. This strategy of Affordable Care Act in my estimation, is not nearly as radical as the politicians want to say it is. Because what it really does, it tries to shrink the gap by getting more commercial insurance, that's the individual mandate and the employer mandate, and by getting more Medicaid for really poor people who can't afford to buy insurance. And squeeze that gap down to the point there's very few people uninsured. That's not nearly as radical as what the extremes would like to do politically. One extreme would probably say, let's get rid of all government. Get the government out of health care. Let it be a free market. That would be a Tea Party kind of uh, argument. The other end, the ultra-liberal would say, put everybody on government insurance. We didn't do either one of those things. We kept the same systems, and we just expanded each side of them. And I, so that's the coverage strategy. Another big important part of this law is insurance reform. In the past, insurance uh, companies have been... Uh, 
um, permitted to uh, exclude people or not write a policy for them if they if they were sick. So you come see me and you say, I want to buy insurance. I say, well, uh, tell me about your health history. Oh, oh, you have cancer now? Well, no, thanks. I'm not buying into that. Um, they've long opposed that. And we'll talk about why in just a second. But in this debate, they said, we'll give, we'll give that up. We'll give up lifetime caps. We'll give up pre-existing conditions as long as everybody has to buy insurance. My first thought was, remember I work for hospitals, I was kind of cynical. I thought, well, that's just great. You'll, you'll give up all these things that everybody has to buy your product. But the more I learned about it, the more I realized they, they're taking the only position that they can take. Let me explain why with a, an analogy. Let me ask you this question. If you could buy your car insurance the day after you had a wreck, would you be paying premiums to the insurance company right now? If you could buy your homeowner's insurance the day after your house burned down, would you be paying premiums now? And if you could buy or pay, if you could buy health insurance the day after you got diagnosed with cancer, would you be paying premiums now? In a rational market, people would never pay premiums before they actually needed them. I'd love to wait till my car gets wrecked to buy my insurance policy because then it's going to be much cheaper than, but that's not how insurance works. So if you want um, insurance to work, the, the commercial market to work, you have to have a lot more healthy people in than sick people. So the argument was if we're going to get rid of pre-existing conditions, then we have to have the individual mandate. Now, that's not popular politically, but it is the way insurance works. You can't keep the pre-existing condition exclusion and get rid of the individual mandate. It falls like a house of cards. The only people who would buy insurance would be sick people. And then there's no cost spreading, so the cost of the insurance policy is virtually the same as the cost of treatment. So um, that that's how the insurance reforms work. Then there are also uh, reforms in the law the third and fourth ones have to do with, with providers, doctors and hospitals. They are, the law is telling us we have to do things better. We've got to improve our quality, reduce our infection rates, reduce our readmission rates to hospitals. People get readmitted within 30 days pretty regularly. Do a better job of that. And um, we're going to track it. We're going to monitor it as a government. And to make sure you do it, we're going to change the way we pay you. We're going to penalize you if you don't and reward you if you do really well. So there are payment, uh, there are provider reforms and there are um, payment reforms that go hand in hand. The other, the final two big things, and I'll go over these again when I finish, the final two big things are transparency. There's a lot of transparency moved forward in this law and that's because we're a consumer economy. If you all get bored listening to me talking here, you could pull up your smartphone and shop for TVs or um, automobiles or anything else. And in this room, before you left this room, you could figure out which TV you want. You want LCD, you want um, plasma, how big, who manufactures it, what price should you pay. You could know where in town to buy it at the right price before you left this room. You could do the same thing with a car. You cannot do it with your health care. Our consumer mentality in this country is not going to tolerate that much longer. And so we're moving toward greater transparency. People want to know who's got high infection rates, who has the best outcomes, what's the price going to be before I go in, all those kind of things. That's just that's where we are as a country, consumer-oriented. And then the final thing is um, health information technology. We've got to modernize and go to um, electronic medical records. They're still paper-oriented. And you know, your generation and the kids who are still in middle school, they are not going to have paper records the rest of their lives. They're not going to tolerate that. Now, I cut my ankle about a week ago on something metal, and the doctor said, when was your last tetanus shot? And I was like, for crying out, I don't, I don't even know who has the record on it. But I think I've had it within the last 10 years. So I had to call around and ask and finally found the doctor that gave me a tetanus shot. I said, yeah, it's 2009. I'm good. That's silly that... Um, that we don't have better access to our medical records electronically. Now, um, every one of you has an ATM card, I'll bet. 
And that means you can go anywhere in this world, in the developed world, and get to your bank account, but nobody else in this room can get in your, in your money. And I'm the same way. I can, I can go anywhere in the world. Why can't we do that with our health records? Don't we care as much about the security of our bank account as we do with the security of our health records? You know, we've we figured it out where it really matters on money. We've got to figure it out now where it really matters on health information. So those are the big things that are coming. Increased coverage is number one. If you're making a list, I see some of you writing. You don't have to write it down. But increased coverage is number one. Number two is insurance reforms. Number three is delivery system reforms. Number four is payment reforms. Five is transparency. And six is health information technology. That's what the law is intended to do. It's not nearly as radical as the political system says it is, but that doesn't mean it's any less political. Uh, we will go through this argument and this debate. We'll fight over it and, and argue and cuss and scream and scratch and claw, and we'll see where that all comes out. Um, unlikely to be repealed, very likely to be modified. Most major pieces of legislation we've adopted in the last century, we go back and, and do constant corrections to them. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, whatever it is, we go back and chip away, and that's, that's the more likely course. I personally think that... Um, it's, it's not going to settle down until we elect another president in three years. Um, president Obama is the target for the Republicans who are running for office, and so he's going to continue to be the target, and they're going to continue to talk about Obamacare. Once we have a different president, and Obama is no longer the president, then if it's a Republican, they'll try to change up the health policy. If it's a Democrat, we'll settle down and, and have a conversation about how to, how to tweak it, I guess. But... Uh, I hope that gives you some perspective, some context for the, the bigger conversation that's taken place since the 1950s in our country, or 1940s, and how this law fits in the middle of it. Uh, let me stop there and see if you have any, any questions or thoughts or comments. Yes, ma'am. Um, about South Carolina, uh, when it comes to maybe later down the line accepting it, is it going to just be brought up? and stuff like that, and then are they, is there any deadline to, like, accepting it? Good question. The question is, in South Carolina, is there a deadline to accepting Medicaid expansion, and how will that happen if it ever happens? There is no deadline. Mm -hmm. States can opt in whenever they want. The three years of 100% federal funding started um, last year, and they will run out in three consecutive calendar years. So if we come in in the fourth year, we don't get the 100% match. Uh, but any time we come in, we get whatever the prevailing match is. How do we do that? In some states, uh, most states, it's a, a joint decision by the governor and the state legislature. And I don't expect that Governor Haley is going to support that. So if she gets reelected next year, I'd say it's very unlikely that we'll expand Medicaid. Uh, she would probably veto it. The legislature would have to uh, pass it, have her veto it, and then override her. To, to make that happen. Now, what could make them do that? They, they overrode Mark Sanford as governor all the time. So they have, they have the power to do it even if the governor doesn't want to do it. Um, but right now they're kind of playing it safe because I think a lot of them are Republicans who don't want to be um, excoriated for supporting Obamacare. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. But if a lot of other states take it and if it begins to work, and all the other states are getting federal money, and South Carolina's not, that might cause them to say, okay, we've, we've battled this long enough. We lost. Republicans lost. It is the federal law. Why do we not want them to take our share of the money? And the argument that, that resonates with most all the members of, the, of our General Assembly, regardless of party, is we shouldn't be sending our state's money up to Washington and not getting anything back for it. We argued that over the stimulus. And, we, and there are some arguing it over this. Um, so that, that's probably how the argument will play out, but I don't know when. Other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Do you think uh, Obamacare is, is the end point, or do you think perhaps in our lifetime we could see um, universal health coverage? I, I don't think Obamacare is the end point. I think it's the natural next step in the debate. But uh, 
I, I don't think it's the solution. Um, I do agree with those who say uh, it's we're going to break this country financially if we don't do something different. And I, for several reasons, I, I believe that I shared the data with you. Um, we all want healthcare technology to get better. I mean, we would like to see in our lifetime that you can't, you don't die of breast cancer or pancreatic cancer anymore, lung cancer. We want those advances, uh, but they're expensive. We're also um, going to have more demand from the baby boomer generation and all. Uh, so we're going to have to reconcile the increasing costs. How do you do that? I, I think you can't continue to promise in an insurance policy, we'll cover anything that you want done. I personally like what Australia has done better than what we've done. And in our country, you either have government insurance or private insurance. In their country, many people have both. Their Medicare program, it's called Medicare, it covers everyone in the country who's there legally. If you all had a work visa and went to Australia, you'd be covered under their Medicare program. It covers everyone, but it doesn't cover everything. It gives you basic um, emergency care, it gives you hospitalization, it gives you physician care, uh, medicines, but it doesn't cover ambulances, doesn't cover surgery, doesn't cover your choice of hospital or physician. Uh, if you want those things, you've got to either pay out of pocket or buy insurance. So uh, they have a lot of people who stack their private insurance on top of their government insurance. Here you get one or the other, there they stack it. Now, some people here have both. That would be a Medicare beneficiary who buys a Medigap policy, a supplemental policy. But in Australia, if the supplement is here and most of it is Medicare, think the other way around. The, the Medicare would be smaller and the supplemental would be bigger. They also do something with market forces. Um, you know, we have an individual mandate now. They don't have a mandate. What they say is you don't have to buy insurance. But once you become an adult at whatever it is, 21, 22, when you leave your um, child status, every year you choose not to buy insurance, your rate structure is going to go up. So a 50-year-old who has never bought insurance will pay a lot more for it when they buy it than a 50-year-old who's always carried insurance. That's a pretty nifty market um, strategy. So you get penalized every year that you don't buy because you're going to want it eventually. You know, young people, people refer to them as the invincibles. I'm not going to get sick. But when you get 50, you realize, all right, I'm coming into the zone now. This is when statistically it's much more probable that I'm going to have some problem. So I need insurance. Well, if you wait till then to start, the market punishes you for that. But you're not ever mandated to buy it. So it's very interesting. Um, it's a different way to do it, I think, because we do want to create incentives for ever-increasing technology and, and pharmacology and all. But we can't afford it. We need to cover everybody at a baseline level and say, you buy beyond that what you want. And we have a conversation as a nation about what we think is the core and what we can afford, and we say, that's what we're buying for you. We can sleep with ourselves at night. That Reagan law, the Intala law, that's our, our conscience law. That's our, we can live with ourselves by giving you access to the emergency room. Australia did it differently. They gave basic health care to everybody, but not everything to anybody. So, interesting.